evening. And uh, welcome to winter. All of a sudden, it got dark. Uh, my name is Chase Rand, and I have the pleasure of being the executive director here at the National Building Museum. And I'm delighted to welcome all of you for this evening's lecture. Tonight's program is part of the museum's Spotlight on Design lecture series, which for now over 10 years has celebrated the best in architecture, landscape architecture, and design. Uh, for your information, the series continues on November 3rd with a lecture by architect Cesar Pelli and the National Children's Museum Executive Director Kathy Dwyer Southern. And you can find additional information about that lecture as well as the entire series, including video and interviews from past lectures on our website. Spotlight on Design is generously sponsored by Lafarge, the world's uh, leader in building materials. And additional support is provided by the American Institute of Architects. And of course, we're most appreciative to both organizations for their continued sponsorship. To say a few words on behalf of their organizations, please first welcome Terry O'Brien, Lafarge Manager, Innovation, Sales, and Product Development. And he will be followed by Peter Kuttner, FAIA, Vice President of AIA National and President of Cambridge Seven Associates in uh, Boston. Terry? Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. As Chase has said, I am Terence O'Brien. I work for Lafarge, a fantastic company in the construction materials industry. And on behalf of uh, everyone here, I'd like to say good evening, welcome, thank you for coming, and give you a few words about Lafarge. Lafarge participates in many national and international events with the objective of contributing to discussions of urbanism, architecture, and sustainable construction. We are especially proud to have worked with this National Building uh, Museum as a corporate sponsor and have been doing so uh, with Spotlight and Design since 2001. Together we've welcomed thousands of guests and featured many acclaimed architects and designers from around the world. Lafarge's partnership with the National Building Museum is one step of our ongoing commitment to work and learn from the architects in our community. We are the world leader in building materials and we are committed to the organizations that support us throughout. We hope together that we can find a larger role through Lafarge and work with you in sustainable solutions for our industry and the general public going forward, while also providing architects with the products they need for today's ambitious projects. This evening, Lafarge would like to welcome Peter Bolin to the National Building Museum, and I'd like to congratulate Mr. Bolin on receiving the American Institute of Architect 2010 gold medal. We would like to thank the National Building Museum for all their work and support of Spotlight on Design and our thanks as well to everyone in the audience for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you and thank you Chase and um, along with Terry the uh, American Institute of Architects is um, delighted that the uh, National Building Museum is hosting this, this Spotlight on Design series. Um, this has been a long-running partnership between the AIA and the National Building Museum, um, and we're pleased to sponsor it because uh, what we're trying to do is really focus the public on the um, architectural profession and the impact that we can have on communities and the importance of design. Um, the Building Museum and the AIA together um, are stressing the importance of design in shaping our future through the use of new technologies combined with a kind of creativity and passion that architects like Peter bring to the profession. We do have a long-standing relationship with the museum, uh, and this is just one of a number of strategic initiatives that we do throughout the year together uh, to strengthen and support our combined influence on the field of the build environment. Um, this is just one of those initiatives, but I think it's really near and dear to our heart. It's a very special aspect of this partnership, and so um, we're happy to welcome Chase and Peter tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Terry and Peter, for your continued support. And now you are all in for a real treat. 
It is my great pleasure to welcome tonight's speaker, Peter Bolin, the American Institute of Architects Gold Medal recipient for 2010. Peter Bolin is the founding principal of Bolin Sawinski Jackson. Founded in 1965, the firm now has offices in Wilkes-Barre, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Seattle, and San Francisco. Their award-winning civic, university, corporate, and residential projects can be found in the U.S., Canada, Europe, Asia, and Australia. In 1994, Bowen Sawinski Jackson received the Architecture Firm Award, the AIA's highest honor recognizing an architectural practice. They are also the recipient of nine national honor awards from the AIA and, and get this, nearly 450 regional, national, and international design awards. It's really impressive. Peter is a fellow of the American Institute of Architects and served as chairman of the AIA Committee on Design from 1984 to 1985. He has been a guest design critic and visiting professor at a number of leading schools of architecture and frequently serves as a juror for national, regional, and state design competitions. He received his Bachelor of Architecture degree from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and his Master of Architecture degree from Cranbrook Academy of Art. He received an honorary Doctorate of Arts from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in 2006. And as I mentioned earlier, Peter was awarded the AIA's Gold Medal for 2010, presented in recognition of a significant body of work of lasting influence on the theory and the practice of architecture. I have no doubt that we will see and hear tonight what we see and hear tonight will explain why this award is so well deserved. And finally, please allow me to note that uh, there are a number of signed monographs of his firm's work, which just coincidentally happen to be available in our museum shop right behind me, and uh, which will be open after the lecture. And so now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Peter Bowen. By the way, it's great to see so many friends here. For me, a great pleasure. Um, somehow, we all have fallen into what we love to do. Uh, it's certainly true of me. And uh, many of you are, probably share that feeling. And one believes that together we can do better than any of us can do alone. Because what we do is not only an what an individual does, but somehow we do, we can do more brilliant things uh, if we, even the smallest job is done by more than one of us. It's my belief. And I should say, before I start, you know we have five offices, as mentioned. We have no headquarters. We do not think we need that. We do our financial management in one place, but we really don't need a headquarters, and we don't have one. And that's not how we work. Um, and that is a key. I think we're going to see this pattern more and more in practices, I believe. So, Steve Jobs, um, our client, says that he is at the uh, intersection of science and art. I believe we are at the intersection of people, place, technology, and art, I guess. You know, whatever we wish to sum all that up with, let's hope it's a kind of art. Um, people. We are very interested in the nature of people, whether they are children, grown-ups, uh, so-called grown-ups. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm a grown-up. Um, how we remember, 
how we feel, how we touch, how we move, how we do things together. We can enable people. I'm not sure we can change them, but we surely can enable them. And uh, I think to some extent modernism has lost this drive to get at the spirit and nature of people. And I think it's essential to doing uh, extraordinarily good things. Whether it's Girl Scouts, when uh, and uh, Harry Gordon's firm and we teamed on this, they were the engineering uh, and um, energy consultants on this, when Jimmy Carter was about. But the children operated this building. And this building did many things to, together. For instance, that where we are looking from is the stage that's a hearth, that's seating. Uh, the children operate not only um, the, the lighting in this building, but turn out, turns out in a, um, a non-residential daytime building, the issue of daylighting is as important as anything. And it's how you uh, modify that. And the children do that. We believed in that as the Girl Scouts did. And we continue to have those interests. This is the Ballard Library in Seattle, the busiest branch library in Seattle. And uh, here, um, uh, Robert Miller, another partner, was heavily involved. I was involved very much. But it's the nature of people in that community, how they use this, how we made furniture for them, how they can see the roof, how they're titillated, for instance. Do not label that periscope, but the children do find it. Grown-ups can't look out of that low slot. <laughs> That's good. And how people move through Seattle City Hall. Uh, sorry, I don't have enough photos of people here, but that's a leaning rail. They can overlook the lower plaza. When we did that project, the design commission, I'm not sure this would happen anywhere else in this country, perhaps, maybe in Berkeley, said we wish to do a building that could have good protests. And by that, they meant large groups could gather as well as small. We designed it for two people. One person, two people, any number, and groups, groups of people. Uh, I think in a democracy that is something we should all be thinking a bit about, how we can make places for people. And how we can do more than one thing with people. In the case of that stair to the council chamber, it's also seating for performances because we you can see the sketch down below. It's also uh, double steps. And so it's used constantly for uh, gatherings. What better way to make life for, again, in a, for a building or in a building or enable life? Uh, it has a fireplace. It's a kind of living room in that space. Uh, the mayor at the time said, look, it's a kind of home. or Apple, how one enables and how one draws people in the case of Fifth Avenue, the first uh, Apple we did underground, how you draw them down. That's a great challenge in retail, how you get people to want to go down. There had always been a failure in that place. Um, and then, of course, how you do it well, how you do a kind of Magic, for lack of a better term. Or Uniqlo, which are probably most of you architects haven't seen yet, uh, that we did um, in three months earlier this year uh, in uh, Shanghai. And it's in an existing building. How would people know that the upper floors were 
um, not just offices, they were also retail spaces, how we could make a place for all of them, how we could draw them up from a subway that comes up next to this space in that building, which had been empty, um, to be pulled in thousands of people, how they could be pulled into that space. This is another culture. At opening, there were 75,000 people in this building. How we could open up that face with doors that are full height. By the way, the Chinese did doors bigger than we could ever do in this country. And so that wall we're seeing in the distance on the left opens up totally when we wish it to, when they wish it to. And we made steps so people could sit along the street. And we made screens because we couldn't, the government would not let us remove the windows um, or change the skin. They'd let us put some new skin forward of the skin, um, and we made a perforated panel that is in the pattern of fabric ripples, um, you know, Uniqlo's clothing. And so that is all closed space. It's not window anymore. Those are light boxes behind uh, which windows became by putting another a reflective opaque surface behind the windows uh, with enough space for lighting and access. And therefore, we transformed the use of that building. But that's about people, how they see, how they use things, how they move, how you draw them up through a place, or how you enable them. And then there are places, whether urban, such as Fifth Avenue in New York, at the corner of the lower corner of uh, Central Park. How do you make a thing in that urban place? How do you make a place for people? Or, and Michael is here somewhere, Michael Ferguson is a terrific landscape architect. We did this together at Trinity. How do you make a building at the edge of a quadrangle that wasn't a lump of a building, but an edge? Well, we made a three-story building. Only one story shows the quadrangle, and it is cloister-like. And it relates to the Gothic chapel next to it. And therefore, it's a gentle building. We believe in making a soft, modern architecture. That's the best way I can describe it. Or the natural world, such as here in California, this photo. Um, it has always been a great pleasure. When as a child, I, my father taught me to uh, tie flies and fish when I was a very small child. We lived next to a trout stream when we lived in Connecticut in the summers. And um, it, is, it was beguiling, the sense of that ravine and that place, knowing about the fish and where they would be and how they would be, learning you could touch those fish, um, seeing the light, sort of dappled light in that ravine with the birds sort of flitting through it, smelling the water. Now... Places, wherever they are, are magical, have amazing qualities. And to make buildings in places, whether they're man-made, a campus, a city, or the natural world, is one of the extraordinary pleasures. We believe in thinking about all of that in relation to our use of those and our relationship to those places. And the natural world at the Tetons, again, thinking about that. Or the barn at Falling Water. On the right, uh, my partner, uh, Roxanne Sherbeck, uh, designed this bat habitat. <laughs> because bats are in the barn, and when we reuse the barn, uh, we have to have a place for the bats. And so we made a house for the bats. 
but again, the natural world. And here and there now, I'm going to get into a little more detail on uh, a few buildings in a, for a particular reason. In this case, a very early house for my mom and dad in Connecticut. It was a summer house, the second house I did for them. Both houses were the New York Times um, on the cover, this case. Uh, and I believe that it, those buildings that my parents asked me to do, and I wished to do, they were, you know, unusual in that while they were strong people, they were trusting. And there are many horror stories of architects working for their parents, or terrible stories. This was uh, just wonderful. And I think I did enable my mom somewhat. But this is in a forest, and you approach it through a dark evergreen forest, and it's right at the shift to a deciduous, sunny deciduous forest. And the path purposely twists, and the house's axis lines up with a tree that, in effect, blocks a straight approach. And because it twists, you find out something about that long, narrow house. It was only 1,800 square feet. And it was green, like a chameleon in that forest, at a time when buildings were tended to be white or brown. It was a chameleon. And some people have said that it, if you took the building away, it would be like you never touched the site. Well, not quite that, but close. And it was designed to have the snow melt in the winter, in the spring, flow under the house. So it would not impede the flow of water down through that forest. And it reached for the early morning sun, and it was designed to ventilate with ease. And just one note. Well... It is a great pleasure working with modest materials. This, these were modest materials. And in those days, they certainly were. And to get, make powerful buildings, again, with modest means, uh, in a way gentle, powerful buildings, the window, the rectangle you see on the left at the end elevation is slightly gray. And when you're inside, it seems to float on that wall. Well, the reason is it has an insect screen, and therefore it's different than the rest of the window. Such pleasure in that sort of thing. And uh, when I was a young architect, I admired Joe Eschrick, at least particularly some of the buildings that did not seem to try too hard. Um, and I wished here, I'd done a building just before this, quite a good one, but it was a bit of a, of a single line, a single thought. And worked hard here to make this building seem easy, seem like we didn't try too hard. Uh, like a great athlete, you know, that you know works hard, but somehow makes it easy. And last point, uh, that deck on the right could have been car. It could have, we could have removed that rock from the site. We could have moved the building, but we didn't. We carved the deck end around the rock, making an accommodation, which is a big point here, and um, sort of anchoring visually the building to the site or anchoring it psychologically, but also making an accommodation. I think the whole thought of compromise versus accommodation, I mean, that's a, better to think about making accommodations. And if you do that, you're liable to make a much more powerful, potent things for people. <clears throat> and then there are materials, whether they're wood here, uh, recycled, um, Jimmy Cutler and I did uh, Bill Gates as we won a competition to do Gates's uh, house, and um, we suggested that we could recycle wood and 
filled most of his complex, which is large, with recycled materials. And we, <clears throat> that uh, warehouser would, a uh, warehouse on the left was about to be torn down, and it would have been used uh, for shoring on construction and so on. And instead, uh, we set up a mill with selling the contractor with Bill's approval to recycle all of this. And we took the best 20% and put them in the house. The wood and detailing you see on the right is all recycled material that we triggered with that um, strategy. And materials again for uh, the Gates garage. This is not their personal garage, but for guests. Instead of building, um, I think the reason we won that design competition, see, other two finalists had, did not solve this issue of getting access down a steep site and where to park cars, particularly guests. So we tucked it under the forest, and you loop over the top and around the edge not knowing it's there, and by the opening, almost like a great cave, and we tucked it under the forest. And the forest tilts, and therefore, if you look carefully at the photo in the upper left, you will note that the ceiling has been chopped away, in quotes, and there's another ceiling above, and that's the tilt about four feet below grade under the forest. Easier and by far more sensible to do than carrying all that extra load on the building, particularly in an earthquake world where that uh, material, which has been a disaster as far as a horizontal movement in an earthquake. And we changed the form boards from, in the case of the body of the building, being the leavings from milling uh, the recycled material in other words, the ragged edges uh, that we used as form boards to plywood form boards above. It was a bit of false history. Uh, and we, <laughs> we drew it. You can imagine doing contract documents for this, those of you who are architects. Uh, we did it, you know, with straight lines and kept the rebars away. And then Jim and I got up on uh, a loader or a lift and jackhammered the edges off to get that ragged edge. <laughs> the contractor, I don't know if he was joking or not, said we were ruining his men and turning them into artists. <laughs> it was great fun. But this is an emotional place. If I, if I, had, I should have thought to include a slide of Bill throwing a party in the space for his mother. This is a great event. And there's a skylight at the back two skylights, and the road comes between them, and I always thought it was a bit like H.G. Wells' story of the drumming of the engines below the earth. When you drove down through that site, between those skies, you wouldn't know what they were. There'd be glow coming up into the forest on a damp night. And uh, we made those skylights like leaves of glass. And you can see the light coming down on the right uh, uh, from above. Uh, and uh, it's just magical. Or glass, another material. One might imagine, you know, that this is different things that we have done. I think they're all the same. I think doing the work for Apple and the houses are the same because we're getting at the nature of people and how we make things and places, and the nature of Apple and all of that. It's all the same impulse. It may look like different architecture. I don't think it really is because it's so rooted in those interests and that love. This is early detailing for the store. At, I think it was Fifth Avenue. But we've actually, we're doing a new one in Hamburg now and you'd be interested in this, working with great engineer, uh, James O'Callaghan, who's a Brit, uh, where we're in 
putting the uh, fittings inboard of the outer sheet of glass. You know, it's layers of glass with plastic, like safety glass, to make it really strong. And in Hamburg, the stair is a beam from top to bottom, both sides. That supports the whole stair, and it's glass. And the fittings are not sticking out. They're inside the glass. And it's the first time we've done that. We, I think we may have begun to do that in Japan on a job. But it is all getting at the nature of the way you make things. And then, of course, it requires great people to do it and a client who's sympathetic. In this case, more than sympathetic. Well, back to wood and many other things here in a house in California, uh, making the corners tell you about how wood turns how you can see the ends, how you see how thick the wood is, um, how you make structure carefully, how you make a window, actually in this case European windows that have been really pressed beyond what was their standard, and how you make hardware that people grasp that is uh, shaped for people's hands or how you support a great tree. And how you work with a barn at Falling Water by making a recycle, putting in a recycled floor over waterproofing uh, to protect the spaces below and to make it a spring, summer, fall uh, performance and use space. And it's interesting about materials because they carry with them all kinds of emotional echoes. For instance, are the bottoms of those columns on the left. This is a house we did in the Adirondacks. First non uh, first log building. We were asked to do a building in the spirit of the Great Camps. And it was a you, it was not a trap. It was liberating to do this. But it's a fairly logical way to uh, flash the bottom of a column, in this case using lead in those days, uh, and pound it to the shape of the column. But if you look at them, you wonder, are they feet? Are they socks? What are they? You know, are they something else? I think that's true of many things we all do. They do cause other memories and other sort of bits of resonance. And, whether, or, and if you're alive to that and you do things constantly that tell about themselves. For instance, we will do a rail out of a pipe and we'll purposely do it so you see inside the rail a bit. And you see it is a pipe, but we don't close it off. I mean, we recess that. I think if you looked at much of the world that way, many of these things are rather simple and almost no cost. This, this was costly. That boulder was not, that was not easy. And you imagine there was a challenge. How do you do a contract document on that one? You need a pretty good contractor who gets in the spirit of things. And how do you tell about columns, in this case on the right, that come down into a wood floor and the support is below. How do you say the support is below and the, wood and the column passes through? Uh, you can see that in Luke Kahn's uh, later building up at Yale, where the concrete columns, I recall, go through a slot uh, and the paving does not quite go up to those columns. And in other places, those columns sit on stone, and there they have real feet. Of course, there are steel columns inside. One needs a sense of humor of this. Inside that stone, posts of steel. But the columns have feet. And how you make, in this case, a, a um, somewhat crafted to steel uh, vanity, as you see on the right. How you frame that building so it tells you about itself. 
It's near uh, here. It's in the Catoctin oh. Mountains. And it's uh, for a Washington client that we did quite a few years ago. And that begins to touch on another issue, and that is if you apply these kind of interests to the, and this impulse to making uh, buildings that are in many ways enabling and sustainable, what does that mean? Uh, here at Carnegie Mellon, uh, we made a building on top of the historic building. It was very light and prefabricated. And the shades were also uh, uh, active solar uh, elements. And they all could be operated by the inhabitants. Or here at Seattle City Hall, where we have shades that are also, of course, light shelves, bouncing light into the interior, or vertical shades, I should have said, yeah, shades, I guess you could call them, um, or on the north face of that building, uh, vertical elements that sort of light up in the early morning and late afternoon and make the view from inside much richer and more powerful. Well, this building in in Pennsylvania along the Delaware River, that's a, an environmental education center. How do you enter? You cross from the north side. You cross a woodland wetland. And then you enter a building. And we, for the, quite a while, wondered about what that north closed wall should be. It could tell you about itself. It could show some framing. It has a few small windows here and there. It can ventilate. And we, <laughs> we kept finding recycled materials, and then the companies would go out of business, uh, you know, because there was not enough call for them. And then we finally found some people up in Vancouver who were making roofs out of tires. So they had never done a wall before. So they, we got them down there, our clients and the environmental education people went out and got all these tires out of the Delaware River and they sawed them up like tiles uh, you know, inverting them back, forward, backward, forward, backward to make this great wall of tires. You can imagine the children, they're all, most of the kids that go here are urban kids from New York and Philadelphia. They will remember this all their lives. They will tell the children of this. And you enter that and walk into this great sort of lit, day, sunlit shed that's designed to cut out the summer sun, to bring the winter sun deep into the space, to heat the floor and a bit of the back wall, that the children can operate the ventilation and make this building comfortable. And it was done on an extremely tight budget. It's in a national recreation area, so it's in fact a national park building, but done for a private organization, but with a national park sort of oversight. Or the library in Ballard that I mentioned earlier. It was a Scandinavian uh, part of Seattle. Uh, seafarers and some lumber people. This face is west. It is within a block of the center of, of the more the locus of that town. Um, it's damp in the winter, and therefore you'd like to have protection. The porch is a generous uh, gift to the town has a green roof, it's daylit, uh, and um, got a code award along with a number of others. The last one did too. So we were thinking about maritime world and all of those containers. We made a plan, as you see in the diagram on the right, of shapes, you know, that had offices and book returns and all of that is a kind of set of containers in those colors. 
and we daylit the space, and we designed it, um, designed the furniture. It, one of the things, you know, in school you learn these sort of hard and fast rules, such as about facing south, the sun, or, well, if you're north, you don't have to worry about it. But the truth is, when you have this bright, pearly sky, you do want to shade it and to mute it, and which we did. And, um, you know, and so you have to really look at every region and think through, and this is not just a performance issue, it's a physiological and emotional issue, which is my one major point tonight about people. We designed the furniture. That was Robert Miller that did it. There are no connections. They're all made out of uh, apple ply or a similar product. They are slotted. They are, they've worked it out, so they're all out of standard pieces. And so if you do the legs and all, you get a real piece of sheet of plywood. And um, Scandinavian library people have been over to look at that because, uh, you know, they admire it. And, of course, Eames was one of our heroes at Cranbrook. And so, of course, we used his chairs. And the roof is green. So, story about Steve Jobs. Hired us to do Pixar in Emeryville. Uh, many uh, animators, that middle space is a kind of gathering space loaded with people usually, except when a photographer was there. And it is a kind of loft building that we saw, and he saw that, my words, that they would inhabit, that his people would claim it for themselves. And it's a steel frame. It's exposed steel. It's not painted. It has a clear finish. And so it kind of looks like bluing almost. It's not outside. It's brick. And it's daylit in the middle with north-facing uh, clear story, sawtooth roof. And that is a gathering space in the middle of the building. And there often you'll see people on skateboards tearing through. And one day I visited and said to Steve, you know, I think I'm the oldest person in this building. And he said, yeah, well, I'm beginning to feel that way too. So... And there's one of those spaces on the right that's been inhabited. And uh, just what we hoped. People would figure out their own way of using these things if we got it right. And I think the more we can involve people and make them be themselves or help them to be themselves, the better. And then, of course, Apple. As I mentioned earlier, at Fifth Avenue, the challenge was going down. But the first two-story stores, this one in Soho and one in the Grove in, San Francisco, in um, L.A. And here the question was, how in a retail environment do you get people to go up? Well, I think, for lack of a better term, you titillate, you make a stair. That's just such a wonderful experience. They want to go there. And they hang out. And that's the first glass we used in Apple. And soon after we did this building at um, the Ginza in Tokyo for Apple, that was a redo of an existing building. We used a double glass wall on that existing frame. Stores those lower floors, and then uh, the rest is office, and then the upper two are the landlord. And the blade that turns at the top was already some other blade before the apple. And so we said, well, it's been approved. We'll use it for apple. It moves. And then there's Fifth Avenue. First store where you go down. You can imagine the challenge of that. It's loaded with people. It's too busy. Most of the apples are too busy. 
We designed the furniture to be, as I think of it, almost timeless. You know, it's just a chair, a table's table. But the, you can see the sketch on the left. My sketch, there was no elevator at that point. But we finally thought we better put one in there and not just have one back in the, in the General Motors building. We have it in our power as architects to do this, one way or the other. Or West 14th. Uh, we don't call it meatpacking. Steve's a vegan. It's a historic building. It was uh, sort of warehousing and a bar below. And we. Here, it's a three stores. First, this in Boston were the first three story stores. And we were therefore doing a glass there. Three stories high, as you see here. Or Sydney, which is very narrow on the face of, a, of a, uh, an older sort of high rise skyscraper. And the uh, stairs are in the rear. And they're over the two stairs, and they're glass. And people move up between those stainless walls. So we were mindful again of making an experience that would be memorable, and also uh, that would be somewhat rigorous in its execution. Or Upper Broadway. Uh, I don't know if many of you have been there. It's the newest one in New York of the four in Manhattan. Uh, Victoria's Secret was there before. Um, but it's a great market hall. We are looking forward, we and Steve, to doing more market halls that are major volumes of places, spaces. You achieve that by putting some space below where you put the other aspects of the store with a nice way to get there. Took some great engineering as well as a great deal of effort on our part to get that roof right. Has all the services, sprinklers, lighting, all of that in that structure that is rather fine. So bowstring trusses that are hardly visible. But it is. It is a kind of each of these things, the houses or this, whatever, library, they're humane modernism, I believe, in that people very much are reacting and interacting. This is second underground. This one opened last summer in Shanghai, Pudong. And it's uh, underground. Again, it's in a sunken court. And we lined up that court with uh, great tower that the Chinese have made, uh, <laughs> crazy tower. And uh, we found that the grid of the shopping center in which this is placed was at an angle in the shop and the parking for it. And so the, the squarish plan of the store is at an angle. But because we made a great cylinder, out of Chinese glass, by the way, which you couldn't have done a few years ago, um, you lose the sense of direction when you come in from the direction of the tower down a stair that can be a great amphitheater. And it will be. And it is now. These were pre-occupancy photos the night before or the day before. And there you could see the first day just stuffed with people on the right. But we are going back to photograph again in the next few weeks. But these were late construction photos uh, that we took. But it's uh, right at the edge of uh, Covent Garden in a historic building related to the interior, the na varied nature of the interior from a, what had been an open courtyard and then a closed, lidded courtyard now a skylit courtyard 
uh, as sort of major two-story volume that's daylit, to other spaces that are have edges of brick and the sort of raw steel framing from the uh, at least a century and a half old. And in that are these sort of delicate ways of moving upwards and downwards in that building against that historic fabric. So, at the same time, we've been doing other things, and I'm going to just touch on a few. Uh, again, going at the nature of people. By the way, again, the Apple Store at Covent Garden is, is extraordinarily busy stuffed with people, probably too many. I mean, we keep finding the apples are too small. They keep doing more. That, of course, is due to Apple primarily, but we can enable them with our work. The Tetons. What are you going to do there? We had a visitor center to do. It was with the National Park Service. So, you know, they're very nice people. They're somewhat bureaucratic. Hesitate to say that, but I think it's probably generally true, except there was a great park director at the time who was super, uh, amazingly farsighted, and we had a foundation who raised half the money, and therefore they carried a great deal of clout. They are the ones who selected us primarily, and they fought for good design, for exceptional design. Extremely early sketch calm space that you enter, an outdoor space, and where people can sit on steps around that place and then enter the building and discover the mountains and, and which are arrayed across the face of that building. And there's that calm space. And there's how it works. And there's my little bee drawing on the left of people. It's a golden rectangle, by the way. If you look carefully, you'll see it sketched in. Uh, you know, I thought worthy of making a Greek proportion with a chewed end, a chewed end of a golden rectangle. And then you enter, and that's what you've got. It is an emotional solution, but it's quite sensible in a way. We met the budget. We use sustainable materials, including those great timbers. We made a fireplace that's both modernist and somehow somewhat rusticated at the same time. We designed it for the winter snows. We brought in a consultant. Those of you who are AIA members might know Ian McKinley. We brought him as a consultant for the alpine issues of snow. Um, careful studies told us that what the code said was not right, that there were some areas that didn't have to be as strong, but we should make them that anyway to meet the code. Other areas that would have been woefully lacking because of snow's uh, likelihood of making drifts on the roof. So we identified those areas, made sure the structure could take those loads. And it bridges over circulation around that court as you see in that sketch below, and uh, then melts in the court, uh, replenishing the water in the, uh, in the water table there. Or Hawaii. We've recently done a uh, private gallery and a house there, an amazing site below Diamond Head on the sea. Uh, we're about to do, just in the early phase of doing a house out of here for a wonderful family with artists, and uh, they're Japanese by sort of culture, and um, it's a complicated site, and I'm just it's so much enjoying doing this. It's so radically different from this building. But our client wished to make this great gallery for himself and his collection. Um, and the stairs between that and a building that has an apartment for his daughter, I think she's there right now, 
uh, and offices and gallery for himself and storage of art. He has a mostly a collection of post-World War II art, American and otherwise. You note how in that space you look out to sea and you also look up to the dead volcano. And in the the dusk, that cult volcano turns gold. I'm hoping the next time we photograph there, we'll catch that gold uh, volcano. So it's how people see things, you know, how they discover things thinking about your point of view. And lastly, House in the Finger Lakes, this um, inner ravine on the east side of uh, Lake Seneca. It's a very deep lake. You know, when the ravine was formed along that edge of sort of rolly plateau, it uh, would make a delta in the lake. And therefore, as you see in the sketch on the right, um, the building lilts a bit, like a necklace or a snake, perhaps. Necklace, or pickup sticks in a way, uh, paralleling more or less the stream. And its tail is just close enough to the waterfall to see it, and certainly in the winter. And its nose pokes out beyond the edges uh, of that ravine. So you also have the horizontal view sideways, uh, you know, along both edges of the lake. And that's sort of a magic position. And when you stand there, you know, you could think about it intellectually. But when you visit, if your antenna are out, you know that's a potent position for them. They wish to have a very bright house because... uh, Both Wendell and his son uh, have some kind of physiological need for a great deal of light. So we brought a great deal of light into this house. It reaches up to the south, as you'll see, and brings light into the building over the top of the edge of the ravine. It reaches out to the lake and brings a great deal of light into the building. It's a modernist building, but... Uh, we saw these, this is the guest house, and it's uh, lower than it looks, just a low angle photo. Um, and Michael Ferguson again was a landscape architect for this, and did a brilliant job of dealing with the natural world here, and in the end making it somewhat seamless in the end. Uh, I mean, every year now it's getting more seamless. I think next spring it's going to be terrific. Um, But these are like saddlebags on the main house and then extending back up the ravine. Someday, I would hope to make a little bridge over the stream, a little log bridge, very modest, and run that path all the way up to the waterfall and put a tiny little building the size of a closet up there that you could sit in and think at the edge of the waterfall. I think that'll be then perfect, if there is a perfect. You can see the saddlebags in this, these, uh, in this drawing. Uh, up above, that's a plan. Uh, below, that's a reflected ceiling plan. You can see how the framing shifts in the saddlebag buildings to a much more modest bit of framing. Oh, sorry. And here you see how the main building reaches up for the south sun. And there you see the effect of that on the left, of that sun streaming in under that tilted up roof on the top of the circulation. And when those rooms, like bedrooms, are open, when the doors are open, they're sunlit from the south. And there on the lower right is that potent position, that potent moment when you're in the room, in the living dining, and really at the dining table, and you can look sideways as we are in that photo 
past the fireplace, it's often we've made a fireplace that you can kind of inhabit. That is a kind of room that has the scale to work in a place like that. I was thinking of Luke Kahn when I did that. Of course, he never did one like that, but I don't think he did. But in a way, and to me, it's my thought of Lou, in a way, making a serious object out of concrete with pillows and, and skylight. And there's a little sketch earlier in the process thinking about that position in the house and the breezes that would come in, uh, in this case from the southwest, and how we should screen them at that porch that you'll see in a moment. How we're extending out onto that delta. We have to sit up in the air because of the potential floods, high water. And there's that screen on the far side that's an extension of the special, somewhat industrial glass wall along the south face of that circulation spine that extends out to make a screen for those sitting on the porch. So we've been very lucky to have all these magic, wonderful places to work in whether urban, campus, natural, and everything in between. But in the most uh, modest of places, or the most mundane, one can also make extraordinary things for people that fit, that resonate in their place, that reflect the nature of people, that, that do enable people. And lastly, uh, our competition winning entry to the new city hall at uh, Newport Beach that will start construction shortly. We're right on budget. And it's, it reaches for light to the north. We shield the light over the council chamber with a sail. Uh, it's a two story building that slowly slides down the slope. So it's never above the visual limit, uh, a mandated limit of a building on that site. And I think it will be uh, quite a good building. And, but it all comes down to everyone in the practice. There are about 180 of us. Uh, I think there are 11 or 12 principals, 11 in addition to me. And I do not control this practice. It is done between us with persuasion and interaction of one sort or another. Uh, we are not headquartered, as I said earlier, and we very much work together, and together we are going to darn well do better than any of us do alone, reflecting the nature, again, of people, places, how we make things in the richest possible way. And I guess, as Steve would say, art. I don't know if I went to an art academy, but I'm not sure I wish to, it's like I don't wish to say science. I'm not sure I want to say art. So thank you. I'm happy to answer questions. We do have time for questions, so I'd like to invite you to raise your hand so I can come around with the microphone so we can hear the questions. I can't see any of you, by the way. I'm going to turn the lights up in just a moment. Question, please. Well, I can, kind of. <laughs> Some of you are my friends here already. Some new are new friends. Okay. I wore these. It's a little gauche or suggested I wear them. My daughter, I wore more even down in, uh, for the FAA thing down there uh, in Miami. And my daughter pointed out, I said something about them clanging, where she said, just remember, Peter, Dad, that the cows, the biggest cows in Switzerland have the biggest bells. <laughs> so... They do clang. We were signing some books earlier, and I kept wondering, what the hell is banging here? 
And I finally figured out it was this. I thought it was something on the table I couldn't see. So. I have a question. Do you intend to use glass stairs for the rest of the Apple stores that you do, or do you think that that can change depending on the, the building condition? Say the first part again. So I'm thinking. Okay. Are, are you wed to the idea of using glass stairs? Because it seems like that's a consistent theme throughout the Apple stores, uh, regardless of what the building, uh, the original building condition is. Sort of. And if so, why? <laughs> so originally we did the glass stair because we wished to make a very special condition that people would relate to and be special for Apple and all of Apple. You know, these buildings are often like, they say Soho's a little like a village center, you know? And that tends to, you, anything you can do to help that, you should. And they think of it as something special. Now, as we've done more, we haven't always done glass stairs, but we use them a lot because they become a kind of, I hate to use the term, I hate it, but sort of a branding business. But they never use that term, and I don't. So, but, you know, the glass stair, like in Covent Garden, is good because the fabric of that historic building reads right through it. It is not as um, uh, aggressive. You know, if you get one of those right, like those stairs, they're not aggressive, and I think that's good. I think it's good to do buildings that are not aggressive, generally. And I think modernists tend now to do aggressive buildings sometimes, or ones that are too neat and pale when it comes to the emotional content. I think they tend to overcome that, but I think there is a little, too, it's now a familiar uh, Apple thing, and that's important to them. On the other hand, uh, particularly in Europe now, where we're doing uh, working in a number of historic places, uh, we're not using much stainless on the inside. We're using the historic fabric of the buildings, and we're rethinking the ceiling like at Common Garden, so it's not what we would generally do for an Apple store, but rather they are fixtures clipped below a historic place, you know, ceiling. Or a new one in Paris that I would have shown more, but I figured I had enough images. Uh, we've done one right across the street in an old bank across in the old opera house in Paris. And it's quite nice and peculiar, actually. And it has a skylight under a, um, what would be a redo of the upper building as a hotel. So it's a hole, you know, a slot above. And so there we aren't using much of uh, Apple's normal fare. We have the furniture. It's nicely organized. Um, we have this, the, uh, you know, the lit um, elements that you normally see in an Apple store, but they're handled differently. And that's also true at Covent Garden. So I think, uh, particularly when we're in the more historic places, uh, it's a matter, it's highly intuitive. You know, to what extent are we going to take a boulder, make an Apple thing inside of this historic building? We're doing in Cologne, I think, uh, it should be a pretty good one. There, there will be more of a Apple presence on the inside. It's certainly true of Hamburg. When you go in that store, you're in an Apple place. Outside, you're in one of those German Hamburg <laughs> buildings that's historic, but man, it's bulky. <laughs> you know, it's there. So it has a stair that I described before that's sleek and strong you know, and confident, just like the Germans were like. <laughs> so, you, you know, I don't, I'm kidding about that, but the truth is you're always thinking about those sorts of things. When we did the work in Japan, particularly, and maybe China now, but more Japan, we wondered if we should be lowering everything a bit, because people tend to be a little smaller. Uh, and I think we did lower them, as I recall. So... The answer is yes, sort of. That's true of most things in life, you know. I don't think uh, anything is black and white. I don't really believe in black and white. 
I don't believe in perfect, even when I say it. I'm not sure that's a great word. I do believe in accommodation, but I believe in this a kind of wiseness about the way you deal with things and sensitivity, whatever that is. And I do believe in kind of inspiration, and I do believe in having epiphanies. It's Frank Pitt. <laughs> Harry knows Frank Pitt, who's another RPI guy from about your vintage, Harry, I think. And I remember at one interview, he used the word epiphany. I said, oh, man. But actually, they are epiphanies. You know, this, all of a sudden, you have this insight about something. I guess that's an epiphany. Even if we all, I always thought it was a religious term, that being a Missouri Lutheran, you know, as a kid. But it's not. I mean, it's a quite a, it goes way beyond that to this idea of having flashes of insight, I think. So, yes, Tom. I have a question about your office structure, uh, <laughs> specifically about your own personal office, its location and size in Wilkes-Barre. I have no office in Wilkes-Barre. When I come in, I, I bounce between desks. And I live there. And Sally and I, we're Sally now. There she is. Uh, we live in Waverly, about 40 minutes away, in what used to be part of Connecticut in Pennsylvania. Most of you probably wouldn't realize that part of Pennsylvania is once Connecticut, and we live in a town that has a green. It was, and then the P Pennsylvanians and, and the Yankees had a little struggle, and the Yankees lost. But um, we have no private office. It's one partner has a semi-private office, and I wish he did uh, no one else does. We have conference rooms, and we have workspaces that are open. We do not mind the fact that people can hear what other people are doing if they need to do something really private and they can't be discreet enough. Then they can go in one of the closed rooms. But we tend not to do that. And beyond that, I carry my homework around in my bag, or you see my bag. It's somewhat unloaded today. I, half of it's back at the Tabard Inn. Um, but that's this whole idea about we don't, I don't, we don't really have a headquarters, and I hope we never come to that. I, when I'm around, I don't think we will. I don't, I have principle, I have, there are 12 of us, we're many places, we interact. Uh, I don't think, you know, it's, we can interact rather easily in person, in flesh, or on video conferencing, or all sorts of things. And a lot of us are friends, you know. I mean, we're all friends, but many of us have been in other places, such as Greg Matola and Carl Backus were in the East. Now they're the principals in San Francisco. So I don't think we need this private office thing, and I like the idea of the interaction and so-called mentoring. I mean, you know, that's sort of a word AI uses a lot, which I agree with. But I like the thought of getting the most out of all of us without being a sort of, I know one or two acquaintances that had a firm out in the upper Midwest, and it was like a happy family, but they did shitty buildings. And so I don't think that counts. <laughs> Excuse me for saying shitty. Not so good. Not such good stuff. So it's not enough to say, well, we have a nice family, you know. <laughs> Fine. For me, it's not enough. But uh, you can get us all to do really good things. And so, Tom, did I answer that enough? Yes. And this is my major tool, <laughs> as you know. Uh, I'm somewhat, I'm the only person in the practice that's somewhat computer illiterate, although I now have an iPad. And I'm slowly working on that. <laughs> but I don't need it because everyone is computer illiterate. So I can be, I can ignore that. Yes. Talk loud enough. Which particular chairs are you speaking of? Oh. Well, they, how have they happened? They're ones we admire from the past, you know, whether Eames or someone else. I don't think there are many crappy chairs around. But, you know, they're like the 40 and 40. I mean, some of you know there's a history to that chair. Rollins, who died recently, he both um, 
Herman Miller and Noel turned him down. He went to Cranbrook. They turned him down because he wouldn't, he was stubborn. He wouldn't do an extra brace, I think. And so he went, I think then it was um, SOM maybe, I forget who, specced it. And general fireproofing made them, they still do. So we have some of those. Uh, and then there are new ones, guys that I admire, and I keep ordering up one or two to try to force everybody not to let them get into a rut. Right? And it's this idea of not getting into a rut. And that's why, you know, this is the reason why. And, and then we have a lazy boy, kind of a cushy thing. And, you know, I don't know, someone must use it sometimes. So, Tom, that sort of explains it, right? I would prefer to keep us all rattling in this fashion. And we're also t testing and seeing what we like, right? Now and then you have something and it screws up. And you say, well, we maybe don't want to use that one, you know, because the fittings don't work. So I think. Do you have more questions? I hear a question, but I don't know where. Yes, someone back there? No? I know there are a bunch of students in the audience, so I want to encourage yeah, they you guys should, to take it. I'm advantage. sure there are students that could ask. Yes. I Students know. a funny word because we should all remain that, whatever that means. Yeah. My original partner, by the way, Dick Powell, was a great partner, although we were like a cat and a dog. Um, he said to me before he retired, he said, Peter, you treat this corporation like a hobby. Well, we're still here. <laughs> it's been almost 20 years, 19 years now. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, no, but I'm kidding about this whole idea of students. Um, well, I had a question about the term used, sustainability, and what that means in architecture. Does that apply to um, minimizing the environmental impact of building materials? Does it mean designing buildings that won't be outdated? Does it mean using materials that won't degrade and need to be replaced? Uh, what does sustainability mean to you when applied to architecture and Perhaps more importantly, what should it mean? Well, clearly, uh, we should be thinking about a world uh, that is less resource hungry. Right? Just, we shouldn't do this. And I don't know that any of us are being brilliant about it. Harry probably knows as much as anyone in this room about this subject. But, um, you know, the whole issue of being rigorous about all of this, and I have principals and partners in my practice, engineers who work with that are quite rigorous. Frank is a good example, usually. Um, then there are this issue of if you make places that people love, is the other side of that. It. It's a most sustainable strategy in a way because life will be around. And one of the worst things is people tearing buildings down and building new ones. And so if you can do things that people value, that really do work, but more than that, that work enough and people love, they're liable to be around way beyond any of us, anyone in this room. If that's true, that's a sustainable strategy. So there's another one. If you do things um, that in, involve people, I think that helps because people will believe in this. I mean, there are a great many people in our culture, in our country, that do not believe in this whole issue. And, uh, I mean, scary. But that's true. I mean, you must all know this. There are people who say this is all BS. And that's just, um, to me, we can quibble about the details, but it's truly terribly important, and it's terribly unethical not to deal with to take those issues seriously beyond that. I think there's something about uh, making, uh, uh, having an effect on our culture, and on children, certainly on grown-ups, uh, where you would like us all to be um, more thrifty and careful and um, more thoughtful of others. I mean, Sally and I were talking about this today. I mean, I, uh, we have a friend who's quite determined, and in, in this case, oh man, you know, and she's a very nice person, but man, 
she's, she doesn't get this at all. She gets a reverse. And I think that's somewhat really unethical. And it's not moral, if you wish to say that. And I'm, I'm not, I don't mean as a religious sense, but just not what humans should do to other people. It's, we have more responsibility than that. Now, I think that doing all this well can make more powerful and touching and telling architecture that's much more moving. And therefore, it's a license to do really good stuff. So beyond all of the stuff you've got to do, you know, it, that's not enough. You've got to see that this is a way to make much more touching, just as relating to the nature of the way we make things, places. This is part of making. If you get it all right with people entwined, you know, the web of all of this, you will make much more powerful and telling buildings and, and much more satisfying, not only to others, but to yourself. I don't know if I answered that well enough. I mean, you could go on with the detail, but there it is. Thank and then you should keep wondering what's right and never be sure. I can't think of a better way to conclude tonight. I'm afraid we've run out of time. I'd like to remind everyone that signed copies of uh, Mr. Boland's And I'll sign the four that are not uh, signed before. It's available in the shop. But all the others are signed. Please join me in thanking and congratulating Peter Boland. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.